Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Let Me Ask You from Hickory with Presbyterian Church. I'm Stephen Lynn White. I'm a ruling elder here. On my left, our pastor, Douglas Barcroft. And our question today, Doug, is what does it mean to be reformed? Okay, Steve, thank you for asking that. That is not a question that any of our listeners posed to us. It was something that you and I were discussing several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, on this broadcast or podcast, we sometimes toss out the word reformed and confessional. Uh, and so we thought that it might be uh, good for us to explain those terms so our listeners would understand them. We know that many of you uh, probably already know what the terms mean, but we just want to be absolutely certain that there's no confusion. For instance, confessional. Mm -hmm. We don't mean that we have a little... Uh, room uh, set off at Hickory with for, <laughs> for the confessional <laughs> in the Roman Catholic sense. We mean something very different by that. And so hopefully our next two broadcasts will help us to understand those terms better. Okay. Uh, when we think of the term uh, reformed, uh, a lot of times people will think in terms of the reform of behavior mm -hmm. when they see the word. Thinking of reform with a, a small case R rather than a capital R. Uh, we think of reformed schools. We think of the organization uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, that assists those that are addicted to alcohol to reform their uh, behavior. And, and certainly we as reformed Christians, we are concerned uh, about behavior. But when we say reformed uh, with a capital R, we mean something very different than just the reform of, mm. of behavior. Uh, what we have in mind when we say Reformed or Reformed theology and in Presbyterian circles and also in some Baptist and Independent circles, uh, we are uh, referring to a movement in the history of the Christian church, uh, a movement that occurred in the 1500s or the 16th century. And the primary reform that occurred there was a reform of, of doctrine. Uh, now, behavior was a concern. Uh, there were many individuals in the Roman Catholic Church uh, previous to the 16th century that were very uh, concerned about some of the abuses that were in the church uh, in that day and time. Uh, numerous people that said the church needs to be reformed, this mm -hmm. behavior of the priests and others, uh, it needs to be uh, changed mm -hmm. uh, in, more in accord with, with God's law. Uh, but Luther uh, is one of the individuals who was a key leader in the reform movement of reform theology. He uh, and a man named John Calvin that I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, Luther was in Germany. Uh, John Calvin was in Switzerland. Uh, the fellow that is standing behind us, John Knox at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, Scotland. There I am standing next to him in 2006. Uh, John Knox studied under Calvin and took the reform movement uh, to the Church of Scotland. And then there was also an individual by the name of Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who also labored in Switzerland. Uh, and what these men began to do is they began to study the Bible. And what they began to see is that what the church needed initially was a reform of doctrine, and that when the, the doctrine was reformed, the understanding of the Bible and what the Bible teaches about the gospel, uh, then by God's grace, the behavior would follow. Uh, we think of Titus chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Uh, it, the grace of God, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. So when we understand the doctrine of the grace of God, uh, then by God's grace in our lives, working through the Holy Spirit, uh, behavior is, is changed. Uh, and of course, uh, Martin Luther was very famous in uncovering the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Mm -hmm. uh, Luther came to understand that this question is, of, of how does a sinner uh, come into a right relationship with God, uh, that it was not being answered biblically by the church in his day. And as we've mentioned before in this podcast, as Luther began to study Psalms, 
in the book of Romans, he came to an understanding of this doctrine of justification by faith alone, uh, that we are declared righteous in the sight of God, not based upon our own merit and our goodness, our behavior and our works, uh, but we are declared righteous based upon the merits of Christ. And when we come to Christ by faith, uh, as beggars with empty hands reaching out to him in faith, uh, his righteousness is imputed. It is credited to us at that point in time. And as Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So the doctrine of justification was very important in the time of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Uh, obviously, there were other doctrines that came out of, of tremendous importance. Uh, we think of the five solas of the Reformation, the emphasis on Scripture, the emphasis on grace, the emphasis on justification by faith alone, the emphasis on Christ, and the emphasis on the glory of God. Uh, all of these were other doctrines that the Protestant Reformers uh, emphasize. So when we think and, and speak of Reformed theology, uh, we are talking about Reformed theology with a, a capital R. And we're not primarily concerned initially about behavior. Uh, we're concerned about what the Bible teaches uh, concerning the gospel of Christ. And when we as sinners understand the gospel, when we embrace Christ by faith, uh, then we are changed people, and the behavior that is pleasing to God will result from the saving faith that we have in Christ. So when we say Reformed theology, we're not primarily focused upon the small case R, reform of behavior. Uh, we are talking about this tremendous movement in the history of the Christian church uh, in the 1500s, led by Calvin, Zwingli, uh, Knox and, and Luther that brought great emphasis to the teaching of Scripture. So Reformed theology refers to this great movement in the 1500s in the Christian church. Wonderful. And next week we're going to talk about what does it mean to be confessional. confessional. Right. Right. So that takes care of what does it mean to be Reformed. And now next week we'll find out about what does it mean to be confessional. And let me introduce right after that is coming the question about the millennium. So whoever you are that posed that question, we're coming back to it. Of course, that is a real softball, right? Mm. <laughs> the question, they want us to compare and contrast the different millennial views. And so we will come back probably the 1st of August and treat that question. All right. Well, thank you, Doug, for uh, your insight through God's Word on that. Let's take just a moment to talk about a movie, another movie right. we're having last week, or last month, rather. We uh, got to see that wonderful film on Luther mm -hmm. and find out how he came to uh, believe what he believed. And uh, so this coming Friday night, July 28th, 6 p.m., here in the Fellowship Hall, we're going to be watching a wonderfully animated version right. of The Pilgrim's Progress which uh, is sometimes a daunting book mm -hmm. for one to read. Mm -hmm. But we feel like this film really does a great job of being true to the book right. and yet still making it something that everyone can understand, children and adults alike. You're encouraged to bring children to this movie. And, of course, we'll discuss before and after um, what the film and the book uh, meant to us or means to us. So that's this Friday night, July 28th, 6 p.m., here at the Fellowship Hall, drinks and snacks provided. And we are Hickory with Presbyterian Church, 2420 Donaldson Drive, here in Eads, Tennessee. We thank you for watching. Let me ask you, it's a ministry of Hickory with Presbyterian Church.